If you have a Bible, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This is where we're going to start tonight. I have a lot of scripture, and I have 45 minutes. Are you guys good if I take up the whole 45 minutes? All right. Y'all don't know nothing about the old Pastor Troy, like the evangelist Pastor Troy. Before Troy was a pastor, I was the guy who they would always, they would bring me in and I would speak to their church. I was the evangelist, right? Like, come in. I'm the rah-rah guy. I'm the guy who gets you hyped about the things of God. So we did, what we would do is we'd come in and we'd preach Jacob, uh, Amanda, Tracy. Y'all remember these days. We would come in and we would, uh, we would preach revival services at night. And then during the day, we would teach people how to street witness, how to street evangelize, like walk up to a complete stranger and tell them about Jesus. How many of y'all, that gives you anxiety just thinking about it? Um, we, would, uh, we would teach people how to do it in a non-confrontational way that was loving. And it was, it was somewhat effective. We wrote a book on it, on how to do it. Um, I have no idea. Do you still have one? Oh, throw that thing away. And uh, no, throw that thing away. It was, called, it was called Passion Outreach. That's what we called it. Yeah. Um, yeah, to like six people. Um, <clears throat> we had to give them away. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, no, not on Amazon. They would probably charge me um, to sell them on there. Um, but we would, we, would, we would preach. And uh, my, my serv- the services at night, we just we would let God move. So it wasn't uncommon for me to preach for two hours and <laughs> preach for two hours. And then uh, we, would, we would have the, the, the spirit of God would show up and he would move. And um, so many, so many stories. And we'd be sometimes there for another two hours after I preached. Um, so y'all know nothing. I see, I hear the yawns out there right now. Um, so 45 minutes is nothing. And some of the most crazy things that I've, I've, I've ever experienced in my walk with Jesus happened um, in the times that I was an evangelist, and I, I absolutely adore those times. I remember a girl in Texas, uh, Grossbeck, Texas. Shout out to Grossbeck. Um, and so uh, we preached a service that, that night. It was more of a youth and young adults type thing, and uh, we had a moment for, for healing, and... Um, So we were allowing people to come up who had any type of ailment, whether it was your back was hurting, your leg was too short, you had a headache, you had cancer. We were praying for all sorts of stuff. And this girl comes up with a neck brace on, like full-fledged neck brace. And she's like, walks up. And I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, I got bucked off a horse and like landed on my neck. And I was like, that's the most Texas thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, and so uh, I called my wife up. My wife stood behind her, laid hands on her back. I laid hands on her neck, and we prayed, and we just commanded um, we commanded everything to line up, everything to work and function the way it was created. And uh, I was like, I, I don't tell people what to do, but you do something that you couldn't do before, right? Like, I wanna, we want to test. Is this legit? Is it, like, did you really receive healing? Because she was going, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. It's like, do something you couldn't do before. That girl ripped that neck brace off and handed it to me. And I was like, we're going to get sued. Like, this is what's, we're going to get sued. So she handed it to me and she starts like running around the church and then going, and I'm like, stop. I didn't mean like re-injure yourself. So the next day, um, during the day, it was a conference, uh, like a youth and young adults conference. And. Um, they had a bunch of inflatables outside during, like, in between sessions and whatnot. And they had this, like, blow-up jousting, right? And they were like, hey, Troy, get up there. Get up there. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I get up there, and I'm like, who wants to go? And guess who gets up there? <laughs> the girl who had the neck brace on the night before. And I was like, I was like, you have to, like, be careful, whatnot, right? And she was like, oh, no, I'm healed, remember, blah, blah, blah. So we're going at it, and just the heat of the moment, she like, she lunges at me with her joust, and she misses, and so she's tumbling forward, and I'm like, perfect opportunity, 
whack right in the forehead. Poof, the head goes back. She hits the inflatable, and I'm like, we're definitely getting sued now. <laughs> definitely. And uh, she pops up, and she was like, great one, Troy. And I was like... So the next night we did testimonies. We were talking, to, we were wanting people to come up and testify of some things that God's done in their life. Maybe some people got healing that night before. And the girl comes up and she's telling the story. And then all of a sudden she's like, I hear no, 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 no. And I'm like, and this old, older lady walks up and she was like, she's giving you like the, the rosy outlook on on the story she was what really happened was long story short is this she got bucked off the horse and it should like broken her neck but and she couldn't feel anything from the shoulders down and she was l paralyzed from the shoulders down they got her to the hospital got her in a neck brace and over a period of time she started gaining some of her sensation back in her arms and her legs and then she started walking and all that and they kept telling her like you got to keep this neck brace on so she goes home she's doing pretty good with the neck brace blah 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 they have her like immobilized look in her neck and she takes she goes to take it off to, I guess to take a shower even though she wasn't supposed to and she collapsed and they life flighted her and the whole thing kind of all over again they put like the neck brace on that week before we got there was when they put the neck brace back on and she started gaining back all of her sensation. And, uh, and then I jousted her in the head. I was like, God, if this is really a legit miracle, let's just test this bad boy out. And uh, it was. Uh, she went back a week later and they were like, everything is in line, everything's holding, everything's good. And uh, that next week she was off, off out, out of the neck brace. And so uh, from, from what I remember, uh, we went back again and preached and that I went into the pastor's office to get ready for the service the next time we were out there. And on his shelf was that neck brace just sitting there as a reminder of God's faithfulness. And so um, I say all of that to say this, if you come to church or you come before God with, with expectation God's going to meet you every single time. So how many of y'all came expecting? Let's do it. I entitled this message today, Food Wars. Food Wars. We're kind of diving a little bit deeper into what we were, we were talking about on uh, Sunday. Uh, this idea of this, this fruit that God wants to produce in our lives. In Galatians 5, 16 through 17, it's on the board. Um, it says this, I say then walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is against the spirit and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. We have Paul here writing to the church in Galatia and he's giving us this breakdown of this battle that we all go through on a daily basis, and that is your spirit man versus your flesh. I cannot assume that everyone in here knows what I'm talking about, so I, I want to be very, very plain. What Paul is talking about is who you are as a, as a, as a child of God, as a human being, is a spirit. I've said this numerous times on Sundays. You are a three-part being. I, had a, I heard a prominent preacher on um, the radio this past week, and I think it was just a bad cut of like where they cut the message. We'll just leave it at that. But uh, this person said that um, you're, a, you're a soul. That's not biblical. Now, I think it was a misspeak and a bad cut because this preacher is usually really good theologically speaking. Well, you have to understand this because when you're approaching scripture, if you don't understand this aspect, when you start reading about the spirit and the, the flesh and renewing your mind, you're, you're going to get really mixed up. So you have to understand you're a three-part being. Who you are is not your body and who you are is not your soul. You are a spirit. God said in the beginning in, in, in Genesis 1.26, I believe, he said, let's make man in our own image, not in the way our body, his body looks or his celestial body looks. Nope, because we find out in the Gospels that, that uh, Jesus says that those who worship God, that God is a spirit, and those who worship God need to worship him in spirit and in truth. 
So what God's saying is, I'm a spirit being, and I created you just like me. You're, you're a spirit being. You have a creative spirit living on the inside of you. That's who you really are. When you die, your spirit goes. Your body doesn't come with, you're going to get a new one. And everyone said, amen. 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 Six-pack abs, bulging biceps. You didn't have to do nothing to get it. Six foot, praise Jesus. Um, I'll be able to dunk in heaven. And so, <laughs> yeah, Jesus is like, yeah, we're going to take that one away. Just so pride doesn't enter in. And so. So your, your, your spirit, you, you have a body and you have a soul, okay? Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect, all of that, okay? And so understanding that your, your spirit was born again the moment you called on the name of Jesus, okay? When you called on the name of Jesus, said, Lord, save me, be the Lord of my life, the Bible says that the old man passes away, your old, your old spirit. This is the, what is called the first baptism, okay? It, it's the spirit of God coming down and baptizing your spirit, making you born again. Uh, you are a brand new being, never existed before. Your spirit man is renewed, okay? Your flesh, your body, not so much. Not so much. That will happen. So now we're in this walk with Jesus. We have this new life. We have this new outlook. We are a new being, one that's never existed before. We're the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. It's awesome because they used to have to go into a holy, a holy of holies and only one person could go in and they had to go through a ton of rituals in order to get there. And that's where the Spirit of God lived. This is how clean and how new you are that if they could not go in without the blood of bulls and goats, and they had to tie a bell around his, uh, around his ankle. And when that sucker stopped ringing, they knew uh, he didn't do things right. He's dead. Pull him out. Pull him out. You, you have to understand how awesome that actually is. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. That you are a spirit being. You are born again and you have the spirit of God living in you. That's how brand new you are. Like sin is gone. He didn't just wash you and cleanse you. No, he just killed the old one and then made a new one. Like, all because of what Jesus did on the cross. Does that make sense? So Paul is writing and he's telling the Galatians here, I need you to understand you're in a war. You're in a war. And this war is your spirit, which is born again and wants to do the things of God against your flesh, which is still very much a part of this world. Okay. In, in, in 1 John, it talk, he talks about how if you, if you say you, you don't sin, then you're a liar. Like if you, if you are saying that you're with, without sin, you're a liar. In other words, even though you've given your life to Jesus, sin is still going to try to take dominion. And if you don't really know that you hold the keys and you hold the power and you hold the authority and your flesh and sin doesn't, then this battle, this war is going to be it's going to seem insurmountable. But when you understand, which Paul's going to break it down for us here, he's saying, listen, you got to understand you're in a war. Your flesh is desiring to do the opposite of what your spirit wants to do. And as a believer, your born again spirit wants to do the right thing. Wants to do the right thing. Your born again spirit does not want to eat those Oreos at 11 o'clock at night. Your flesh does. Your, your born-again spirit does not want to go on a porn site, but your flesh does. You're like Oreos, porn, like, trust me, sometimes they're similar, all right? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Your flesh doesn't want to do the right thing. Have y'all y'all ever had this battle going on? It's the proverbial angel on one shoulder and the demon on the other. And like the angel's like, you know, you shouldn't. And the demon's like, it's just one time, man. What the, man, man, man. Like, it doesn't matter. It does. It does. And so, so I, I've thought about this, that I want to do a, a series on this in church. And I want it to be during football season. Because what I want to do is I want to put a bed up here. And I want to do like a scene where like a person rises up out of bed, like alarm clock goes off. They rise up out of bed. And then 
there's a one football player over here fully padded, and there's another football player over here fully padded. One's wearing a flesh jersey. One's wearing a an actual jersey, not just their flesh, but like it says flesh on there. And then a jersey over here that says spirit, and then they run and Oklahoma drill each other real quick, like right here in the middle, like <sighs> helmet to helmet, tag, hit each other. That's what happens the moment you wake up. And so I'm in. I feel sorry for whoever's going to be in the other jersey. That was, I think that was Brady. Dear Lord, we'll have a funeral right after this. Yeah, no, that would be bad. Oof. Ooh, Lord. It's like Ray Lewis. No, no, I'm the guy in the bed. I'm waking up. So, so Paul works, he, he, he lays out some works for us here. If you continue down in Galatians 5, in verse 19, I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. I just feel like it puts a little bit more in our language. Um, but this is what it says in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature or your flesh, that's exactly what he's talking about. When you follow the desires of your flesh, the results or the fruit is really clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, Lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. He's like, yeah, yeah I put out a list. We'll just, etc. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now let's pause. Some people are thinking, well, I've done the, the sexual immorality part and I've done the impurity and lustful pleasures and I'm known to have an outburst of anger and yeah, sometimes jealousy kicks in and I may have a drink or two too many and get a little plastered. So I must not be able to inherit the kingdom of God. That is not what he's talking about here, okay? He's not saying that this is a list and if you get a certain amount of check marks in the amount of list that you're just disqualified, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is when a born-again Christian or somebody who just refuses to follow God decides that they're going to do things the way they want to do them, and they are in a repeated, as, the, as the, uh, certain translations will tell you, it's like a, it's a practice of these behaviors. So in other words, it's like somebody who's rolling the dice and saying, you know what, I know I should probably walk the way God wants me to walk, but I'm going to roll the dice, I'm going to live the way I want to, and then one day, bam, you get taken out by an asteroid or something, and, and you are in, in this lifestyle choosing it and practicing it and living this every day, this is what he's talking about. That, that person's not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Not because they did all of these things. It's not that, because Jesus has already paid the penalty for our sins. He's paid the penalty for the sins of the world. The only thing that people are going to be held accountable for in that day is how did you respond to what Jesus did for you? And if you're living this life, Paul's clear. Your choice was not Jesus. Because when you follow Jesus, fruit follows you. Okay, I just want to be very clear. I don't want anyone to walk out of here going, my goodness, man, I just, out of the 14 that were listed there, I don't even really know if it's 14, I just make another number. Um, man, I checked 12 of those off. No, no, I'm not talking about your old man. I'm not talking about a moments of weakness, or maybe this is an ongoing battle in some of these places for you. But as long as you're going back to Jesus, confessing your sins, allowing him to cleanse you and allowing him to work in you and your heart is geared towards him, don't worry about this list, okay? I just want you to know what the fruit of following your flesh looks like, okay? Because sometimes, I should say all the time, it's good to know what a certain fruit looks like so that you can call it out, not in somebody else's life, in your own life. Ah, I realize that whenever I get pressured or I feel stressed, man, I go straight I go straight for the bottle or I go straight to lustful thoughts and sexual immorality or I go straight to being angry or thinking all about me. Like those you should, you should realize like 
those are triggers. Like, all right, stress, boom. I know when I'm stressed, I'm going here. Now I need to change that, right? If I keep going to that well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink of the, the fruit of it. Like, I'm going to drink of that well if I keep going to it. So you've got to understand these things. When you understand what the fruit looks like, it's easy to pinpoint how easy those seeds look and, and come and get planted in your life. Amen? But he doesn't leave us there. Praise God. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. If that is the fruit of a flesh-led life, this is the fruit of a spirit-led life. He says, but the Holy Spirit who lives in you produces this kind of fruit in our lives. It's good to know what this fruit looks like because we can know which one is of the enemy and sin and which one's of Jesus and the Spirit. He says, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and everyone's favorite, self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and have crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every, 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 every part of our life. Not just the part on Sundays, not just the part that does the devotions, but in the part at 11 o'clock at night when no one's around, in the part of your life when you're in the vehicle and somebody cuts you off and your kids aren't in the back, every part of your life. Jesus is not Lord if he manages a certain part of your life. He is only Lord when he takes it all over. This is the fruit that marks a spirit-led life. So you can gauge, how's my walk? How's my walk with Jesus? How's my walk going? Am I, am I on fire for Jesus or am I just lukewarm? Am I just going through the, the motions or is my heart truly devoted to him? And you can look at your life and you can see the fruit and then you can tell which one is which. The constant battle is our flesh warring against our spirit. And Jesus was clear in what we would be recognized by. Matthew 7, 20 says, yes, Jesus speaking, he says, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Okay? So you can know yourself, those in your circle. Hey, what's the fruit? What's the byproduct of my day in and my day out? What's the, what, is, what does my walk look like? And you can look at the fruit and you can gauge where you're at. So how do we gain the upper hand? That's the real question, right? In this battle, in this war, I don't know about you, I kind of like watching the History Channel every now and again. I like seeing like uh, some of the old wars and like all the little things that happened in, in that war that gave who eventually won it the upper hand. Like I really, I find that stuff intriguing. I'm like that guy who's on Friday, I'm on Friday nights watching like, uh, you know, unearthed uh, on, on Discovery Channel. Like, I'm, a, I'm that kind of guy. Uh, I, f I find that fascinating because somebody said it, somebody smarter than me, but if you don't know history, you're bound to repeat it. And I think that if we don't realize how easy it is to go from a spirit-led life to a flesh-led life, then over time, like a current, we're going to start to drift. And so we kind of got to pay attention to some markers and some certain things, but how do we gain the upper hand on this war? Romans 13, 11 through 14 kind of gives us an idea. It says this, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So I kind of pointed this out a little bit on Sunday. Like we're getting closer. You got to understand the times. We're getting so close to Jesus coming back. I don't know when, could be in my lifetime, could be in my kids, could be in my grandkids, my great grandkids. I don't know when, but we are closer now than we've ever been. That's what Paul is laying out here to these believers in Rome, where he's talking about this idea of understanding this time that we're living in. In verse 12, he says, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. 
Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Verse 14, if you have a Bible, you might want to underline this. But put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Now, I'm not smart, so I had to like go and kind of look into a concordance about what the word provision is, and I could sit up here and give you the Greek for it and all that and sound way smarter than I actually am. But literally, the definition for provision from Greek to English is provision. So it's like, that gave me absolutely nothing. So I went up and looked up the word provision, and it means this. To provide opportunity. To provide opportunity. So what Paul is saying here is we've got to daily, we've got to choose to put on Jesus and make absolutely no opportunity for our flesh to gain a foothold. How do we gain the upper hand? We gain the upper hand by not putting ourselves in compromising positions. We gain the upper hand when we surround ourselves with people who look like Jesus. We gain the upper hand when we are pouring in more of Jesus than we are of the world. It means to provide opportunity. So Paul's saying, don't provide an opportunity for the enemy, for your flesh, or for sin to take hold. So if porn is an issue, then you probably should not have access to a smartphone. And you probably should not stay up late at night when the temptation's probably the strongest. If getting angry in your vehicle at other drivers is a thing for you, maybe you should stay out of Missouri. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I can't keep, like, that one just, I feel like it always gets a laugh, so I'm always going to go back to it. It is. It's so true until you go to Oklahoma. And so... A, this is what I want, you to, I want you to understand. A dedicated life is considered fanatic to the world, but it's fruitful for those of us who desire Jesus above all else. I'm going to say it again. A dedicated life is and will be considered fanaticism. You're a fanatic to the world, but it is fruitful for those of us who desire Jesus above all else. We are headed into a time where going to church is going to be a, a label on you as a fanatic. We are going to go into, we're, we're about to go into a time where just the mere fact that you label yourself a Christian is going to cause you to lose friends. And I'm not talking like those who are like, oh, oh you're a Jesus freak. <laughs> like, no, like enemy of the state kind of thing. I don't know how quickly we're going to get there, but all the signs are, 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 are pointing there. And so we, as I said on Sunday, we've got we to decide which side of the line we're on. Because soon when you have a dedicated life to Jesus, in other words, I'm, I'm controlling what I'm watching. I'm controlling what I'm listening to. I'm controlling who I'm hanging out with. Like, I am not surrounding myself. Now, listen, do, do not take this out of context. I am not telling you to stop hanging out with people who don't know Jesus. That's dumb because that's the reason why we're here. But having people in your life who have direct access to influence your decisions, those people need to be limited. Because those people can affect your fruit. And a dedicated life to a lot of people is going to look fanatic. I remember when I was in Bible school, uh, we, have, we have this thing at Rhema uh, every year. It is called camp meeting. 
and it is I absolutely love it. Uh, me and Alicia have gone back for winter Bible seminar and camp meeting a couple times since we graduated. We're talking about doing it again this year. But it is literally a week long. Camp meeting is a week long event that happens. And they have three services in the morning, eight, nine, and 10. And then they have a seven o'clock that evening. So you're going to church four times a day for like six days straight. And I remember being in Bible school and I'm, I'm on fire for Jesus. Like, whoo, my family doesn't get it. They don't understand it. They, they think it's weird, but I'm all about it. And so grandma calls and I'm at like the nine o'clock and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm at church. She's like, uh, it's Tuesday. I was like, I know. She was like, what are you doing at church? And I was like, she goes, shouldn't you be working? I was like, no, I took the whole week off. I took some, my remaining PTO. She was like, to go to church? I was like, yeah. She was like, that's weird. It's like, okay, whatever, you don't get it, cool. She calls me the next day, 10 something. Just got out of, got out, just got out, it was almost like 11. Just got out of service and she called again and she was like, what are you doing? I was like, just got out of church. And she was like, it's like 11 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. Were you just got a, got a, weren't you at church yesterday? I was like, yeah, yeah. She was like, what is going on? I was like, this is called camp meeting. And she was like, what is that? And I was like, well, we have an eight o'clock, we have a nine o'clock, we have a 10 o'clock, and then we have like a seven o'clock at night. And she was like, you've been going to four services a day for the last three days, and it's gonna continue through the rest of the week? I was like, yeah. She was like, are they brainwashing you? And I was like, probably with the Bible. She was like, I just don't get it and I never will. And to a lot of people, that's the way it's going to look. And I'm not saying you have to go to church four times a day for a whole week. I do think that if you thirst and hunger for the things of God, you're gonna find it wherever you can get it whether it's on a first Wednesday or it's on a Sunday or it's on a random Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, if you're hungry for the things of God, then you are going to find it. You should, you should listen to other people other than me. Like I should not be the only biblical voice in your life. Highly recommend you. There's some great pastors out there. But when we continually live this way, dedicated to his word and hungry for more of who he is, to the world it's going to look fanatic, but to the rest of us, it's how we produce fruit. It's how we produce fruit. Romans 13, 14 in the Amplified says this, but clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, make no provision for indulging the flesh, Put a stop to thinking about the evil cravings of your physical nature to gratify its desires or lusts. Clothe yourself. You have a choice every morning when you wake up and you go into your closet and you're looking at your clothes and you're like, what am I going to wear? What am I going to wear? And then you look down and you're like, oh, that's my favorite shirt. But I'm not sure that it's clean. It smells all right to me. Pop it in the dryer, wrinkle release, get it out and wear it. And then halfway through the day, you look down and realize there's a stain that you forgot about. That's happened to me a few times. But just like when you go into your closet to decide what you're going to wear for that day before you go before people, You should do the same thing spiritually. When you wake up and you hop on Facebook, that's your first choice of what you're going to wear that morning. When you turn on ESPN to catch up on sports, that's the first thing you've decided you're going to wear. And God says, I want to be the first thing you decide you're going to wear every morning. That if you want to win this war, I'm not saying it has to be for forever, 15 minutes or an hour or whatever. Like, even if you just pop open your Bible and read the, the verse of the day on the Bible app, like at least that's a starting point. Like maybe your alarm can send you a scripture in the morning or something. And when you wake up, 
You have to like, I've seen those alarms where you have to like read a sentence before your alarm will actually go off. Those things are demonic. I had one that, you, that said I had to, I tried it one morning. It was the dumbest thing I've ever done. It said I had to take 29 steps and, and, and then I had to, I had to go back 29 more steps and sit down and turn it off and it would go off. You know how hard it is to walk 29 steps when you're barely awake? You're like one, two, three, four, five. Dang it, I forgot where I was at. First thing, clothe yourself. Clothe yourself with him. I gotta speed this up a little bit. Ephesians 4 27 says, Don't give the devil an opportunity. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Don't even give him an opportunity to infiltrate your life. Yeah, I know. I know I'm I know it's something that God's redeemed me from, but I'm gonna keep going back to it. That makes no sense. That's like if you give up drinking and you're like, oh, I've been sober for three years, and then you decide you're gonna go hang out at a bar every night. That's not smart. It's, it's not, and that's exactly what God's saying. It's like, don't go back to the old things. Don't go back to the things that used to enslave you, thinking just because you're redeemed now that it's not going to grab you. What you have to do and understand is that what you feed will grow and what we starve will die. And so we have to continually take inventory of our lives and figure out where is it that I need to start starving and where is it that I need to start feeding. And I, I want you to know as a Christian, what you should start feeding is your spirit life, is who you really are. You should, you should up your word life. You should feed worship music to your soul. You should feed the word of God to your mind. That should be the things that you feed on. And what you should starve are the things that so easily ensnare you and they trip you up. So, so the, the list that we were going through, if, if you're seeing that lust is a thing in your life or drunkenness is a thing or angry, being angry is a thing for you, like figure out where that stuff is being fruitful the most and starve it. And then pour your energy into things that are feeding your spirit. Because what we starve is going to die and what we feed is ultimately going to grow. And the gates of our life are so important. The eye gates, the ear gates. These are so important. You think it's just Game of Thrones and it's just casual and everyone watches it. I've never watched it. I wanted to. And then I went on to uh, IMDb, and there's like a parent guide. That's always what I go to when I want to watch something. I go to the parent guide, and it gives you a breakdown of everything. It tells you all the uh, cuss words in it, it uh, how many cuss words, and it tells you all the sexual content and all that. I care about one thing and one thing only when I'm watching a show or a movie, and that's sexual content. That's the thing that God's redeemed me from. So I don't want to go back to that. And the moment I opened it, it was like a, uh, it was like a novel. It was like... And that was just the first episode. And I was like, yeah, that one's not for me. How many of y'all know if I would have started watching it, I would start feeding some things that I should not be feeding. And the fruit that is not of the spirit would start to grow in my life. And so what I chose in that moment, even though no one was around me, was that I wanted to be more devoted to Jesus than I, did, than I wanted to be entertained in that moment. And so I had to choose, am I going to starve it or am I going to feed it? And so I chose to starve it and praise God, it's not a thing now. But if I would have chose to feed it, then that fruit that we do not desire, which is the fruit of the flesh, is going to start to grow. And I don't want that. So we have to be careful what it is that we're seeing. In this church, we shut down gossip like it's no thing. I tell our teams all the time, like, listen, we don't do that in this house. We don't do that. If you have something you need to say, you either go say it to them or get somebody else to go with you to say it to them. Sally does not need to know what's going on in that other person's life when they have no, they have no business knowing. We, we shut that down. We've lost people in this church because we shut down gossip. We just don't do it. That's fruit that I don't want in this place. 
Because what happens is these gates, our ears, start to get a little tickled. And then you start getting division and dissension and you get a lot of things going on in your church and your body. And that's not what you want. Our gates are important because a flesh led life will kill all the good in our lives. And some of us wonder why the good things in our life keep dying or going away. And I think that's the check engine light where you need to start looking at the fruit in your life. Romans 8, 1 through 6 says, Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those that are in Christ Jesus. Because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Praise God. That's that, 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 that Spirit that that now lives on the inside of us, the sacrifice that Jesus made has set us free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do since it was limited by the flesh, God did. And what he's saying is this, we could not do enough good things to get to God and to bridge that gap that existed because of our sin. And what the law could not do since it was limited by our flesh, meaning we couldn't do enough good things, God did himself. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in flesh like ours under sin's dominion and as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be accomplished in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, they think about the things of the spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. How can you know if you're being led by your flesh or by your spirit? Peace. The spirit of God is always going to lead you by peace. And the flesh is always going to lead you by appeasement. In other words, I, I, it's something I really, really want or something somebody really wants me to do. How can I know? How can I know in my life which one I'm being led by? Looking at the fruit, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we've got to take inventory of the things that we are allowing ourselves to think on, the things we're allowing ourselves to hear. And we have to take inventory of those things and kick out the things that do not, that do not produce the right fruit in our life so that we can stay in line with what God has us doing. See, God has delivered us from the slavery of sin and our flesh. Now our mind is the deciding factor on if our born again spirit thrives over our not born again flesh. It's your mind. What are you feeding your mind? What are we feeding ourselves? Because ultimately we have the freedom to choose. I'll end with this. Norman Vincent Peale said this, change your thoughts and you change your world. Change your thoughts and you change your world. 1 Corinthians six twelve says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. It may be lawful for you to look at things. It may be lawful for you to watch things. It may be lawful for you to hang out with certain people. It may be lawful for you to do certain things. But the question you have to ask is, is this going to feed the bad fruit or is this going to feed the good fruit? Because if it's going to feed the bad fruit, in other words, it's going to produce the fruit of the flesh and sin in my life. I don't want it. I want that away from me. I am going to starve that. And then I'm going to start feeding the things in my life that are good. Although it may be lawful for me to do it, it doesn't mean that it's helpful for me to do it. Yeah, it may, it may be lawful for me to 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 sit down and binge watch said show. But is it really going to push me closer to Jesus? Is it really going to produce the fruit of the Spirit on the inside of me? Is my life going to look more like Him? 
Now, I don't want you to walk out of here and go, man, I can never watch anything. Never. No. No. I'm saying look at your priorities, and the things that are at the top of your priority list are the things that are watering the fruit in your life. Listen, I love Oreos as much as the next person, but I have to do it in moderation. Why? Because man who eats Oreo gets Oreo. Man who eats muffin tops gets muffin tops. Moderation. Yeah, go enjoy a good movie. Go enjoy... A, a, a good book. Go enjoy the, the fun, awesome things in life, but do it in moderation. Listen, I love the Chiefs as much as the next person, but if they move the games to 10 o'clock on a, on a Sunday, your boy's going to miss the game. Why? Because it's not the top of my priority list. Jesus is. 100%. So how do I make sure that my spirit wins this war? I got four things for you and then we'll be done. We'll go through it really quick. How do I make sure my spirit wins this war? Number one, feed your spirit daily with the word of God. The word of God is the bread of God. How many of y'all like bread? Like honey wheat bread. Cinnamon raisin bread. Whew, I love bread. The moment my doctor tells me not to eat bread, life's over. <laughs> Feed your spirit daily. Make sure you, you have that devotion time with him. It's going to feed your spirit. And if you feed your spirit, you're going to produce the fruit of the spirit. Number two, get people in your life who hold you accountable, not just to anything, but to the things of God. Hey, bro, I, like, I've noticed like your posts on, in, on Instagram and, and on Facebook and Snapchat and whatever other ones are out there that I don't know anything about because I'm almost 35. Um, thanks. And so, <laughs> hey, I've noticed those things. They haven't been very like godly. Like they've kind of been worldly. I've seen some F-bombs in there. I'm seeing some stuff that doesn't represent Jesus. The people who are going to hold you accountable are going to have tough conversations with you. People who are going to maybe call you out on some of your, can I say this crap? I'm going to call you out on it. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. If you really want to win this war that we're all in until the day we die, then feed your spirit with God's word daily and get some people around you who are going to hold you accountable to the things of God. And then number three, limit the bad fruit in your life. Shows, friends, news, family. <laughs> I'm not saying cut them out, but limit them. Limit the shows, limit the things. Listen, I, my favorite show in all of the world, I've watched it up about a million times, Lost. If you've never watched all six seasons of Lost, you are lost after you watch them, but still it is the greatest show ever. Oh my goodness. John Locke, Sawyer, it's my favorite. Such a good show. But there's some, been some times in life where I've sat down and I have binge watched and we're talking like over a hundred episodes. Like there's a lot of episodes, six seasons where I'm like, did nothing for three weeks but watch Lost. And God's like, what you doing with your life? My wife's called me out a couple times on stuff like this. Notice you haven't really been reading your word. Reading the word, you haven't really opened your Bible in a bit. In the bathroom. Get some people in your life gonna hold you accountable. Limit some of that stuff that's extra in our lives. Don't, I'm not saying don't enjoy it, enjoy it, but enjoy it in moderation. And number four, take inventory of your thoughts. Take inventory of your thoughts. You may not know this, this set me free and I don't know, hopefully it's good for you too. But my wife said something to me when we were dating and I wasn't really a Christian and she was, and she said, 
Troy, did you know that every thought that you have is not yours? What? Time out. Yeah, it is. She's like, no, no, it's, it's not really your thought. It may come to you, but it doesn't mean it's your thought. And then it got me thinking. That's pretty much what marketing is, right? To get you to think about things that you weren't thinking about before. That means it's not your thought. It was their thought. They just got you to think about it. And that's exactly what the enemy does is he gives you thoughts and then you go, oh, well, I can't stop thinking about naked people. So must be who I am. It must be what I do. Must be, must be my thing in life. I can't stop thinking about alcohol. Must be, um, I must be an alcoholic. Not every thought that comes to your mind is actually yours. And so the Bible says this, think on everything that is lovely and true and honest and pure and of good report. In other words, you get to choose. And as a born again Christian, it's just as good as in the world because they're, a, they're, they're enslaved to, anyone who doesn't call in the name of Jesus is enslaved to their feelings, their emotions. They're enslaved to sin. Us as Christians, we're not, and we shouldn't be. We've been set free. We get to make the choice when a thought comes in, am I going to dwell on that? Am I going to meditate on that? Or am I going to cast that out? And if it's not of God and it does not produce the right fruit in my life, I need to take inventory of it and understand what's going on up here and command that thing to go in the name of Jesus. Take inventory of your thoughts. Romans 12, one through two says, therefore brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That is your spiritual worship. In other words, put yourself in the presence of God daily. L listen to what he says. Read his word and let his spirit lead you. Verse 2, he says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, what is pleasing, and what is the perfect will of God for your life? Do not be conformed to this world. I know the world does it a certain way. I know the world watches certain things. I know the world talks a certain way, but that is not the way we do it in the kingdom of God. No, I've got to present myself daily before God. Let him transform me from the inside out. Feed on his word and understand that I'm in a war. And every time I give in to the sinful nature, into the flesh, I'm feeding fruit that is not going to be good for my life. And I don't know about you, but when I pass away, I want the fruit of my life to be the thing that feeds my kids and my grandkids. And they can look at granddaddy's legacy and say, oh, he followed God. Even when it wasn't popular, even when it wasn't cool, he laid it all down. He took up his cross and he followed him. And I want to live like that. You're in a war, a food war. And the question is, the food of your thoughts and the food of your life, are you gonna feed it to your flesh and produce bad fruit? Fruit that's gonna drive you away from God or are you gonna feed the fruit that's gonna produce more of him in your life? Did y'all get anything out of this? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to get into your word and God, we just pray that we leave this place changed. And we don't leave the exact way we came in, but that God, we leave changed and rearranged by your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would trim away the fat of the world in our life, mold us and shape us to look more like you. And as we go into our Thursday and our Friday, which is the best day of the week, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that our outlook would be different, that we would have your joy living on the inside of us, and Lord, we would be walking through this life with boldness. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Hey, don't forget, if you have youth in your life, you have kids, we have a game night happening here this Saturday. Uh, we have family reunion coming up on the 23rd, which is a Friday night. We have a good night planned there too. So I hope that you'll join us at all of those. Without further ado, y'all are dismissed. Have a great week.